you remember where we have been, if you have been here for the first two weeks of this study, Daniel chapter 1, we talked about the God who works behind the scenes. Daniel chapter 2, the God who establishes his kingdom. Uh, the setting, of course, for our study this quarter is the ancient Babylonian Empire about 2,600 years ago. Even more specifically than that, the heart of the Babylonian Empire, the city of Babylon itself. An absolutely incredible ancient a world in and of itself where many uh, biblical scenes are set. We're in Daniel chapter 3. We last left off the end of Daniel chapter 2, of course, this incredible dream that the great King Nebuchadnezzar has. It is a dream of this great statue with a head of fine gold and chest and arms of silver and the middle and its thighs were bronze and its legs were iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay and there is great distress throughout the empire because no one can be found to interpret what this vision or this dream is all about. Finally, Daniel is brought in, and by God's power, he is able to clarify that uh, the different materials of this great statue represent different empires. And it all goes back to the fact that there is a God in heaven who reigns and is in control. And yes, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon are comparable to this great head of gold. But they are not going to last forever. And when God sees fit, power is going to shift and another empire will arise. And in response to that, we read the end of this great uh, prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. If you've got your Bibles open there. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Nebuchadnezzar, as he hears that, falls upon his face. He pays homage to Daniel. He commands that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God, listen to him, because we're going to notice the shift in gears here in just a moment. He says to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. And so we come to Daniel chapter 3. Last night, millions and millions and millions of people watched the State of the Union address where we had all of the, the joint session of Congress and uh, the President of the United States and so many different people gathering in. You imagine with me that last night, whomever the President is, but we'll just take historically the one that we have right now. Uh, you imagine a President of the United States gathering in, in that sort of a setting and announcing to people, you need to know that the next time you hear on the radio or see on television or we, we push something to your smartphone, that this alert has happened that on those occasions, whenever you get that notification, you are to fall to your knees and praise the President of the United States as the God of all gods and the King of all kings. Completely foreign idea to you and to me, right? You imagine not necessarily expecting that sort of thing, maybe tuning in for idle curiosity or not really interested at all in hearing just as that replays, but you imagine a President of the United States announcing that if you want to be in good standing 
Whenever this alert is sounded, you are expected to fall to your knees and worship a man in Washington, D.C. as if he were God on earth. What would you be thinking in that moment? Just turn that over in your mind. This is not a hypothetical situation for three men in Daniel chapter 3. We don't know exactly how long of a time span there was between Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 2, we were listening to Nebuchadnezzar. He just absolutely blown away at what he has heard from this Hebrew, Daniel. And he's willing to appoint Daniel to a great position of authority. And Daniel makes requests for his three young Hebrew companions. And Nebuchadnezzar obliges that. But then we come to Daniel chapter 3. Verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. If we take the classical definition of a cubit, we're talking about a golden statue that is roughly 90 feet tall. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. He sets it up about 6 miles south of the city of Babylon on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justice, uh, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. It's not a hypothetical situation. There are, of course, Hebrews in Babylon. We uh, ha have already studied in Daniel chapter 1 how they got there. In the background section of our material for this evening, that second bullet point, God's prohibition against idolatry would have been well known to those four young men. At the head of the Ten Commandments were, You shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. The Old Testament scriptures were filled with declarations that the Lord is the one and only God. And not only that, but he has used his prophets to make clear idolatry is one of the reasons you've been sent into exile in the first place. Hebrews know all of that. And now this declaration is going all over the kingdom. Therefore, historically we're told in verse 7, as soon as all the peoples heard all of this noise, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You not only imagine hearing the declaration, but then watching as everyone else around you bows down and does exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar has told you to do. And you're one of the only ones, if not the only one, far and wide, who's still standing up straight. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Why would these certain Chaldeans do that sort of thing? 
do you think? This is not the first time that we're going to notice this sort of thing happening in the book of Daniel, where there are native-born Chaldeans who see certain things going on, and they see it as an opportunity. Why? Why would they do that sort of thing? Alex? It wouldn't surprise me if these were the same Chaldeans that were both humiliated and saved by Daniel in the previous chapter. Okay. There's already some tension. Daniel chapter 2 uh, bore that out. Some tension between native-born Chaldeans who are not empowered to do what men like Daniel are able to do. Why, why would they do that? Uh, okay. These three individuals, they, uh, Daniel had already put them in positions. Probably Chaldeans think we should be in that position. Okay. They're ruling, and they're put in that position. So, uh, Joshi, did yeah. they have that part? Here are these foreigners who, whose God in the eyes of the Babylonians is certainly not in any way, shape, or form greater than the Chaldean gods. Otherwise, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies would not have been able to do what he did to the city of Jerusalem and the temple that had stood there for so long. But they see these men climbing the ladder. So very, very quickly. We noticed in chapter 1 how God gives good favor to Daniel and his companions in the midst of a, a miraculous situation. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel is able to do something that no one else is able to do. And they just keep climbing because they're able to get the attention of the king and fulfill these whims of the king in ways that no one else can. Jealousy, perhaps, is, is very quickly entering into all of this. They see an opportunity. Everyone else is bowing, but not these Jews. And so they come forward and they maliciously accuse them. They declare to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears all of this shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. True or false? That's not true, is it? We haven't gotten the idea to this point that these men are, are looking to assassinate the king or, or just intentionally rebel against the king for the sake of rebelling and, and just being different. But we noticed last week that they are living as good citizens to the best of their ability within the confines of, uh, of God's word, even working to deliver other people, showing concern for native-born Babylonians. But the rumor is that the line that is said in Nebuchadnezzar is they pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now that's true. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that these men be brought. They brought them before the king. He answers in verse 14 and says, Is it true? Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? The tone has changed from the end of chapter 2 in these great uh, lines of praise for a God who gave Nebuchadnezzar what he was looking for to now this incredibly arrogant and haughty attitude. If you are these men and you hear this from the most powerful man on the face of the earth, what are some possible ways... You could respond. Well, notice the way that they did respond in just a moment. What are the opportunities? What are the, the 
choices in this moment? What? Well, they could have went ahead and said, okay, we'll, we'll bow down. Okay. Worship him. They could have said that. Could have done exactly what he wanted. Yeah. Bill? Other thoughts, Andrew? They, uh, they could have pleaded ignorance. Oh, okay. I didn't realize this. Yeah. Or they could have been argumentative. Okay. You imagine being in that moment, Craig. What are the possibilities here? Well, there's always the idea of compromise where we find ourselves in that position today where, okay, I'm going to do it, but I don't believe it. I'm just going to do it to get through it. And, and there are minds that I sat. It just doesn't mean anything. Okay. Inwardly one way with certain convictions, outwardly a, a different way. Is it? Yeah. Well, you could re try to reason with him. Um, my the God is going to deliver us is the, is the is the same God that interpreted your dreams, and the people that come up with this God that is the statue out here uh -huh. was made by the same people that couldn't. Okay, Alex. They could have accused their accusers because I noticed that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if they paid no attention. To. Clearly, he knows they pay attention to them mm -hmm. and are doing what he wants them to do, and then. <laughs> He only questions uh, the worshiping aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Is this just some sort of an ancient blip on the radar where, you know, this happened, but it has never really happened again in any form or fashion? Not at all. I mean, this is one example of many. Many, many times that the people of God have been called in a, a pivotal moment. Eric, you had your hand raised. Just to, to Zippy's point, it yeah. could have been argumentative mm -hmm. about we're going to have a theological debate at this point in time. We're going to debate why God is better than, than, than your God and, 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 and give all the reasons why uh, I'm going to serve the, the God that I'm going to serve uh -huh. when we're going to find out you know, the different takes of the Yeah, yeah. It is a serious situation. All sorts of possibilities that could be rattling around in your head. And I want you to think about how this is not an isolated incident. We'll talk a little bit more about that once we're done. The gauntlet has been thrown down in verse 15. And in verse 16, here is their answer. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Why is that? Why would they say that sort of thing, Dwight? They were, they were off about it. Okay. And there was no need to hesitate even further. Okay. And Their actions are about to speak louder than any words, right? Their minds have already been made up. These are men of conviction. There's not going to be any waffling. There's not going to be any need to try and barter your way out of this. They know exactly what he has said, and they know what they will and they will not do. Verse 17, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, let's take just a moment and, and analyze what they're saying because it gives us the clearest window possible into what's going on in their hearts and how they could possibly do what they're about to do. Bottom line, verse 18, we're not going to do it. All right? Where's that coming from? Verse 17, if this be so, if this is truly what you are demanding of the people under your authority, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Why in the world? How in the world did they believe that? Where does that come from, Wayne? So again, when you look at the history of the Jewish people and you realize that, you know, by the command of God, they've been taught all okay. of the times throughout the history that they've been delivered. You know, going all the way back to Exodus and being brought out of Egypt and everything that occurred between there and this point, that they realized that 
fire and, and things made a man is not a big deal to God. Yeah. And God can never come. He's part of the Red Sea. He's done all of these miraculous things. Are these men able to do this because they have led very pampered, sheltered lives? <clears throat> Always gotten exactly what they could possibly ever want from God? Not at all. Think about where they are and how they got there. Tom, you had your hand raised. Where does this come from? Well, I mean, they're not, whenever you know, they're not focused on what's happening to us here. They're focused on when he, when he says he will deliver us. Yeah. Out of your hand. I mean, and they're saying maybe we're going to burn up, but we're not going to be under your authority. Okay. In this regard. Uh, I mean, even if they burn up, God's going to take them and take them out of the situation. All right. Let, let's explore that for a moment. How in the world can these men with a straight face say, we believe God is going to deliver us? If in fact we perish in this furnace, God is still delivering us. What do they mean by that? How could you die in such an unimaginably horrific fashion? And still believe that you're being delivered. Craig? Well, it speaks to their faith, obviously, and okay. their understanding that God has a purpose. And just like many of what we've read, how will God's purpose be accomplished? And maybe they don't exactly know, but they know that it will be accomplished, whether okay. it's by their death or by their life. Okay. Phil? They're full of complete faith in God and also knowing that no matter what man can do, just like to live in some time. All right. And then the eternal life is waiting. And then it's there. Okay. Is the story really about trust God in the midst of terrible circumstances and he will always be delivered? Or is it about glorifying God, whether by life or by death? It's the latter. Right? I mean, the scriptures are full of examples of men and women who had great faith and they held on to that faith in the midst of tremendous odds and obstacles and persecutions and horrific things and they died. Right? But they believed even as they died, this isn't all there is to existence. And even if we lose our lives here, God is worth it. His glory is what this is all about. And He can be glorified when I get what I'm looking for and when I don't get what I'm looking for. When my life goes the way that I would like it to go and when it is heartbreakingly difficult. My responsibility is to glorify Him. By doing the right thing, regardless. Why you had your hand yeah. Go ahead. Well, the thing, uh, the thing of the, uh, this year is victorious. Mm -hmm. Regards to the outcome, these individuals. Regards to the outcome, as they look at it. Regards to the outcome, whether they save us or we deliver, victory is ours. Yeah, yeah. Great way of tying that together. Let's keep reading. They've said, if we lose our lives, we won't do it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19, was filled with fury. This is not a man, undoubtedly, who is used to being told no. Right? He just got told no by three foreigners. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace. There really was a furnace. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their outer garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not pass three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. What in the world do we do with that? We don't really know, right? I mean, there are all sorts of different things that might come to our minds. It, it, perhaps it is some angelic being. There have been those that have made arguments that, in fact, it, it would be the, the pre-incarnate Son of God who is right there with them in the fire. Whomever that is, there is something otherworldly going on here, right? What are we meant to take away from this, do you think? Why is that detail of that fourth person important? Alex? It's not them that are doing this. There's okay. something else that works. Here. Yeah, great way of putting it. There is someone right there with them. The, the men who carried them up there, they're dead because this furnace was so hot. Not only are the three men in there, but there is another being who is right there with them. And they're standing up. They're not hurt. This fourth being, it, it looks in some way incredible. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Why would Nebuchadnezzar say that? I mean, obviously that's not what he said just moments before. Remember, he asked, who is the God who is going to deliver you out of my hands? This man has a tendency, does he not, to say whatever he's feeling in the moment and then very quickly forget it. Is he the only one that struggles with that? You know how easy it is to sing the praises of the Most High God in an assembly on Sunday morning. And then on the way home, Sunday afternoon, act in a completely God-dishonoring way. Steve, you had your hand raised? Or somebody I thought maybe had their hand raised back there? Phil, go ahead. I was just going to say, he's never seen anything like this before. Yeah. But like you say, look at what all the Jews saw in their bottom of Egypt, mm -hmm. and they still forgot. Absolutely. You know, scriptures are, are full of that, and maybe that, that's worth us thinking about for a moment. It, it is remarkable. Leviticus chapter 10 gives us the account of Nadab and Abihu dying because they offer, uh, offer unauthorized fire to God. Sometimes go back and read Leviticus chapter 9. What happened just before that? These incredible things that they see. And you know, we reason in our minds, well, we've never seen anything like this. And if we could just see it with our physical eyes, then we would really be all in. Not true. Right? I mean, you think of the apostles themselves, what they saw, and how easily they turned their backs and, and, and run. Scripture is full of examples of people who saw incredible things at the Exodus. In the days of Elijah, they see fire fall down from heaven. And it is days before they're worshiping some other pagan idol. Craig? Well, Think about Nebuchadnezzar's progression here, too, as you go through the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. First, there's the dream. Yeah. He's shown God that way. Now he physically sees something before him, but it still doesn't take effect. And then as you go on and we get to the next part, now he's got to experience it himself. Yeah. Yeah. So we're at a high for the moment. And by the time we get to Daniel chapter 4, we're going to be back to a low. Up and down. Up and down. He's not the only one who experiences that. Right? Ruby, go ahead. Um, do you think it's, we do that because we're uh, in this world, living in the now moment and what's going on and everything mm -hmm. is yeah. of our head? I think that's a great diagnosis uh, of a serious problem, right? Having our eyes and our focus and our hearts much more set on this world than we would like to admit, Wayne? 
One of the things I like about this, if you look at Daniel 2 and then at the end of this chapter, Daniel 3, mm -hmm. it seems like Nebuchadnezzar has a favorite way of getting rid of his enemies, and that's <laughs> chopping them up into pieces, right? Yeah. And chopping them up into pieces and destroying their house. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we see that in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, the wise men that couldn't interpret his dream, and then we see it in here, anyone that doesn't want to this out of this. And I think it's interesting that, you know, he kind of has this go-to way of getting rid of people, but for this specific reason, he's, he chooses a fiery furnace, and I think even his method of trying to kill these people showed God's glory, because it gave God that avenue to yeah. say, you know, I can appear and I can be among you, and no matter what you can manifest, you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, great thought. He says in this moment, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then they came out from the fire. He wasn't just seeing things, right? Verse 27, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and they saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. I mean, you, you've got mighty men of his army lying dead and their hair was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Sounds strangely like the end of Daniel chapter 2. Right? Ups and downs. Ups and downs. Very Fickle, just like people today. He's impressed though. And so he says in verse 29, Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses lay in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Another common thread that we find throughout the book, just when there are those who try and use something to get at the people of God, it ends up only exalting the people of God all the more. These men are ready, come what may, to do the right thing. And so here is the question, of course. We asked it at the bottom of the material. How is that same sort of pressure felt today. We noted earlier on that this is not one single isolated historical blip on the radar. And so how can we relate to this, Tom? Huh? I don't get too political. It's, it's all over the place. So we work and political correctness. You can't say this, you can't say that. Or, I mean, if you if you say the wrong thing, put safety marks around it, mm -hmm. the defense, and you can find yourself in a difficult situation to say the least. Okay. It depends on you know how the way you describe that. Dwayne, go ahead. Um, I mean, I mean, we live in a country where the laws of the land are directly contrary to the laws of God. You know, things that they have passed and things that they are doing. Uh, say, sex marriage, for example. Things of that nature are, are in direct conflict with the laws of God. Okay. And so, you know, a lot of people were, they, they, they start to rationalize and, and try to, well, you know, you're old fashioned, you're this, you're that. No, our, our God has said, this is what we can and this is what we can't do. Although the laws of the land, you know, the, the laws of the, the, the man made laws of man, can change. God has said, this is what you can and can't do. Okay. And so, regardless of peer pressure, regardless of political opinion, or regardless of public sway, there are certain things that we can and can't do, and God has been very clear about it. What? I think, um, I was thinking before about Victoria's Sunday. You look at good, these individuals. Uh, and, and regardless of what we might think the outcome is, or regardless of what the outcome is, maintain our faith in God, and you can take our one way or the other. Okay. It's what, how Paul reasons, right? There is plenty that I would like to enjoy in this life, but my attitude is I will glorify God whether by life or by death. And so for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Ruby? 
I just have a comment to make about what I, I practically lost my job because I was a Christian. Okay. Um, it was years ago, working for Lazarus in a not not women's department with this high fashion all this time. Mm -hmm. Because my name was Greenwald. They thought I was stupid. And she said something, and I said something about uh, services or something. She mm -hmm. said, well, you're Jewish. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. And she, I wasn't, next day, I was in the party basement down there. Really? And I, I, it was all, they were real nice to me there. Yeah. They were helping me out. They were, and then I think that changed my, because I was not, my favorite. Yeah. Phil, go ahead. The other day, uh, just up the one overseas, I saw Brandon Graham on the news program that said about the Christians being told very well, in their hearts they can change. But yet, what he was getting at, in their heart they can change, but they're still not living the way, what, how they want you to do. Mm -hmm. So don't do any operating when you show their faith, and that's kind of what's going on. <laughs> More and more in this hyper-connected world, we hear horrifying things that are going on in different parts of Asia, different parts of Africa. Uh, this is not hypothetical in real-life parts of the world in which we live. I'm, I'm just kind of going from left to right here. Craig, go ahead. Well, if you look at the big picture here, God has created man to serve him, to mm -hmm. glorify him, like we talked about. He's put us in this world and we have a choice to make. And as we find our way through life in different nations, countries, times, we have that choice to make. And each one yeah. of us in different times and places we can experience different pressures and different things, but there's always going to be that choice out there where we serve God or where we obey man. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else. Jason, you have your hand. Please go ahead. I, just, I think our culture encourages us to do a lot of things. So I'm just thinking, in this particular example about how you have someone in a position of authority telling you to do something, yeah. counter. And it's a little different than societal pressure, although societal pressure is real. But I think our cases, I think, you know, Ruby kind of touched on some cases where you might find that where whether it's your boss or whether it's um, a teacher or even the encounter a public official or a police officer that would tell you to do something that is contrary, you know, and I think whether it's, you know, download pirated software at work, or, you know, I mean, there's lots of little things that they're not as big as everybody around us necessarily bowing down and worship somebody, but it could just be a matter of the whole herd of everyone doing it. And yeah. you stand out like that. And it's, sometimes it's the smaller things that are the hardest for us because you know you easily slip into it. I think those are the things we need to really turn to sharp. Yeah. Alex? I like to boil big questions like this on really simple ideas. The simplest idea I can do is are we going to trust in the cross? Because Paul tells us the world thinks Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is false. And I can see where they get that. Mm -hmm. But are we going to depend upon this life and our position in it to save us and to give us something after this life, or are we going to depend upon the cross? Yeah. Yeah. Good thought. Any other thoughts? Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I've just been really knowing all this in. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a gentleman by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who, after things have happened with the dream, and now we've got the fiery furnace, as he really resolved to humbleness and resolve that, man, there is a God, or is it fear? Yeah. For him to take Shagrach, Meshach, and Abednego and elevate them even more, now it's like, man, I just saw what happened. Now I'm scared. Yeah. And we can find ourselves in the same situations. We can take something, maybe not miraculous, but we can take something that we know in our hearts with faith, yeah. how it should move us. 
But with fear, we don't make the move. Yeah, yeah. Just almost the opposite of never had. Good thought. You know, several of you have, have brought up a variety of different good examples. Uh, that there is one that stands out to me from just uh, about a week and a half ago. You may have heard uh, the story of the Atlanta fire chief, Kelvin Cochran, uh, the fire chief over all of the, the enormous city of Atlanta. Uh, he recently wrote a book, and, and it was called, Who Told You That You Were Naked? Uh, uh, of course, a, a quote from God's question in Genesis chapter 3. And within that book, he talked about uh, God's will for sexuality, among a variety of different other things. Talks about uh, the seriousness of listening to God and abiding by what God says, even when uh, culture is going a completely different way. Uh, he, the book, as you can imagine, was full of all sorts of quotations from the Old and, and the New Testament. And he gave a copy to three city employees who didn't ask for it. And a few days later, he was fired by the, the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, and of course, I mean, it, it has been picked up. If you haven't seen it, if you go looking for it, it's not hard to find at all. It has been reported all over the country. But this is the sort of thing that more and more and more we see in our country. There was a, I, I won't give it a whole lot of time, but there was a, an op-ed piece in the New York Times that uh, reviewed all of this and, and basically said, nothing wrong with having conviction or Christian convention, uh, Christian convictions, nothing wrong with having those as long as you keep them in the pew or in your home or in your heart. And increasingly that's the sort of thing that we will hear in our culture right it's all right to believe these things you just don't push them on me uh, and we're going to see more and more how this ramps up through the book of daniel right to the point where now a law is passed that you cannot pray to any god other than the sanctioned God. And what are you going to do in that moment? The more that we go back and, and we analyze what's going on, hopefully the more that we see this is real. It is real within the realms of mankind. And 2015 is not unique in that regard. Raina, you had your hand raised. Last word. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's a good book out there called The, the Intolerance of Tolerance. If you're interested in that uh, sort of thing, it's, uh, it's a fascinating idea. Donna, last, last word. I heard a third one that said we have to be Just a couple days ago, I think, something like that. Yes, 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 yes. Um, of course, bottom line there, Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men, and sometimes that will lead us in humiliating pathways, right? I appreciate you being here.